if these courts are going to accept Dirks as the primary method of proving tipper tippy liability and then sending someone to jail, they should know, and they, the people being charged, should know exactly what they are being charged for and if what they are doing is wrong. I find it. Legislation changes month to month, year to year. But over the last century, the changes have been astounding. Join Karen Woody and her students from Washington and Lee University to dig into 100 years of insider trading law. Welcome to the fourth episode of Classroom Insiders. This is the podcast hosted by me, Professor Karen Woody, and I'm joined each week by one of my students. And this episode, we are lucky enough to have Colin Manchester with us. So Colin, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much. I'm currently a 2L here at WNL Law. I went to University at Albany for my undergrad and then worked in the aerospace and defense industry for three years, which was super fun, but decided I wanted to come back to law school. I'm really interested in transactional work for the most part. Next summer, I'll be with Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett in New York City, where hopefully I'll get exposure to M&A and private equity. And I kind of want to give securities litigation a shot. Hopefully they're pretty open to rotations. And with any luck, I'll join them after I graduate. (laughs) Yeah, I hope so. That's wonderful. What a great experience. And maybe some insider trading work while you're there. Let's just jump in to discussing insider trading and what we've been talking about in class and sort of what you've gleaned over the last few months as we've been going through this pretty much chronologically up until now. So maybe just help the listeners in case they haven't heard some of the earlier episodes. Give us a little bit of an overview of where we have come from before we get into sort of the more modern day cases related to insider trading after Justice Powell took bench. But give us maybe a little bit of the overview of the arc of where did this all start? Where are we now? All that. Yeah. So I guess the best place to start would probably be under Katie Roberts and Texas Gulf Sulphur. And those were one opinion from an actual judicial court and one opinion, an administrative opinion in Katie Roberts that basically outlined what was known as the disclose or abstain rule. So basically that rule, which was the bedrock, was if you're in possession of material non-public information, you're going to be under a duty to either disclose that information to the public before trading or abstain from trading based on that information at all. However, the glaring issue with that is A lot of the times, if you're in possession of material non-public information, you're not actually going to be allowed to disclose it to anybody because you'd break some duty of loyalty or another fiduciary duty owed to the source of the information, whether it be a company in the example of Texas Gulf Sulphur, their executives couldn't publicly disclose that they had found these ultra worthwhile deposits. So the glaring problem with that is the disclosure abstain rule quickly becomes the abstain and abstain rule. So no matter what, if you have this material non-public information, you're not going to be able to trade. Really interesting. That's a good way to say it. Because right, what does it mean to disclose if, without you know maybe broadcasting it wildly? And even then, you probably still need to be abstaining even throughout that <laughs> period. So interesting. Okay. So what happens to the disclosure abstain rule? From what I recall, the SEC enjoys... A few decades of success after success, once they are able to shoehorn that uh, rule through the courts. Is that your understanding? Yeah, it is. They like to take it for quite a ride up until Justice Powell joins the court. But I understand why they did it. These cases immediately alerted the human intuition to a problem because it was so fraudulent. So an average person reading what these executives did would immediately realize, oh, that's not fair. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. So while I think the rule itself is quite antiquated, I can see up until Justice Powell getting in the court why the SEC got away with it. That's really interesting. Okay. First of all, who is Justice Powell? Give us some background about that particular individual and maybe why he is of particular importance to us at WNL. Yeah. So Justice Powell came to the court as one of, if not the most prominent corporate and securities-based attorney that the court had ever seen. He came from Virginia, heavy practice of corporate and securities law concerning uh, railways and tobacco, especially. In fact, his career as a corporate attorney was so lucrative, he originally turned down 
his original nomination by Nixon. And only after another individual told him that it was a civic duty to his nation to accept the nomination did he actually accept on the second time that Nixon offered to him. And he was a brilliant corporate attorney, so much that he was revered in his firm and so much that his lifestyle was going to change going from the corporate or the private sector to the public sector that on the day of his confirmation, William Reinquist looked at his wife and said, aren't you so excited? This has to be the most exciting day of your life. And she said, no, this is the worst day of my life. I'm about to cry. No. Um, Oh my gosh. What a crazy story. (laughs) So it just kind of shows how prominent the lifestyle was and how much fun he was having outside of the court. But he decided to join the court as an alumnus of Washington and Lee University Law School. So there's our nice connection. We have the Powell Archives in the school and a wing dedicated to him with his chair from the court and all of his files between him and his clerks and him and other justices, which, as you and I know, have gleamed to be very important and enlightening. But when he came out of the court, he was known as a corporate friendly justice. And he was very weary of the overreach of the SEC and did not like the disclose or abstain rule. So these kind of qualms about administrative overreach are throughout his opinions, where he reads into the insider trading laws, the 10b-5, that there really needs to be some kind of fraudulent activity and fiduciary duty to establish violation. But I'm sure that we'll get into that when we start talking about the cases. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so yeah, tell me about the cases. What in your mind are sort of the most important cases that the pal pens while on the bench? Yeah. So the first one I think would be Corella. And that's just because it's the chip away of the disclose or abstain rule. And it's the first time we're really seeing this fiduciary duty concept that needs to be present in order to establish liability under the, a 10b5 violation. So In Powell's opinion, he believes that there's only a duty to disclose information if there exists a relationship of trust and confidence between the party. That's how it's originally written in the opinion. Now we commonly recognize it as a fiduciary duty to someone else or something else. And therefore, that lack of fiduciary duty, if that is not present in the facts of the case, there can be no duty to disclose. So if you don't have a duty to disclose, you're not going to be in violation if you trade the information which makes sense if you happen on an airplane and find a piece of paper in front of your pocket that you'd have no idea where it came from, but you're able to put together that XYZ Corp is going to buy ABC Corp. Why are are you owe any duty to either of those corporations? You should be able to trade on that information for a profit. And like I said, it's just a stark change from the traditional abstain abstain or disclose rule because this opinion makes it clear that the duty to disclose does not solely arise from possession of material non-public information. There has to be that fiduciary relationship. That's interesting. So it seems as if he is okay with it maybe being an uneven playing field, or I mean, I guess that there isn't equal access to information across the market. Is that right? I think that his experience as a corporate attorney and just someone who is learned in corporate activity he inherently understood that equal access to the fair market is an impossibility. There will always be asymmetric information. And instead of imposing such a hard and fast rule, there should be a rule that allows the security markets to operate as free and flowing markets with experienced financial people able to disclose information and receive information relevant to incorporate that information into the fair price of the stock. So his understanding of the corporate markets because of his years as a corporate attorney, I feel really pushed some of these decisions. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes sense to me. It is an interesting thought, though, and something that we've discussed a bit in class. Well, I, I was just struck by what you said about there might be some moral imperative maybe to equal access to information, but just the impossibility of that is maybe just the more pragmatic or practical approach. Which, I mean, it just tees up a lot of questions in terms of the role of law or not. It should law be maybe aspirational? Should we still hope that there is equal access to information or not? I know that's something we have bantered about, given how hard it is to really get our arms around 
how you do regulate insider trading, particularly if you come from a place where the goal is equal access. And maybe, I actually think maybe Powell doesn't even acknowledge that the goal, that that is the goal. That there should be some maybe times where people have certain information and others don't, and that plays an important role in its own right. So I don't know. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Yeah, actually, you mentioned the word pragmatic, which is often not used with conservative leaning justices. And it just so happens I am in the thought or I'm in the field that believes that Lewis Powell might have been a closeted pragmatist in reading some of his opinions <laughs> because he really does care about the full functioning of the thing, was it be a financial market, the criminal justice system, the big overarching thing. He just uses more conservative elements to get there. The most seminal case is Dirks, where I think he takes an incredibly pragmatic approach to reading into some of these elements of a 10b5 violation, when quite frankly, there's nothing there to say that this is what it means. He's pulling that out of the ether. Okay, yeah. Tell us about Dirks. What's happening in that case? What does Pal do, do with that set of facts? Yeah, so I guess it's really important to kind of highlight the uniqueness of the facts here, because I think it does play into a, a big role in the original or the final opinion. So Dirks was an officer of like a New York investment advisory firm, and he received some non non-public material information that equity funding of, of America was involved in a massive Enron level accounting fraud that was bound to come to close soon and it would drive their stock price to rubble. So what he did was actually tried to disclose the information to both the SEC themselves, which is funny and a which we'll get to in a little bit, and a Wall Street Journal publication. And what he was trying to do was expose whistleblow on this giant accounting fraud. However, he was also an officer of this investment advisory board, and he disclosed to clients that he had found out that this equity funding was incredibly fraudulent with its bookkeepings. So they ended up, his clients ended up selling before it was publicly disclosed that this company had years of account fraud. Now, <laughs> the irony of that is the SEC didn't really see it that way. They saw only the fact that he tried to disclose it to his clients, therefore avoiding huge, huge loss positions by getting out early. So <laughs> this, I, I would bet the farm really annoyed Powell. <laughs> The fact that just this unique circumstance, he doesn't get so much into the fact that he tried to disclose the information to two outside sources, which to me is a huge part of this opinion that we've discussed in class, but we'll leave that for another day. But he does give us a new take on insider trading liability because even though there was that relationship between Dirks and his clients, he actually believed that there not only needs to be a relationship, but the tipper, the Dirks in this case, must be receiving a personal benefit in order to establish liability. Therefore, he gives some examples of pecuniary gain or reputational benefit. So the way I see these are the simple quid pro quo of, hey, you give me tips on the upcoming merger or acquisition, and I'll give you $500. Or in somewhat of the same vein, hey, I know that ABC is merging with XYZ. If you give me the information on QXY, uh, we can just trade it off and we can both profit and no one will ever know because it's just information trading hands. And I guess the other way was the reputational benefit. And this, I think, was a really big sticking point because Dirks was still an officer of the investment fund or the investment advisory company. So there could be a claim made that by alerting his clients prior to an incredibly bad loss perpetuated by equity fundings, fraudulent accounting, he would be seen as the go-to guy for the traders, brokerage firms, and what be it. So Dirks ends up not being found liable because there exists no benefit to Dirks, no reputational or pecuniary benefit. That is not to say there wasn't a relationship because there clearly was between Dirks and, I guess, his firm and their clients. So it's just giving you another layer from, you go from disclosure abstain to, okay, no disclosure abstain, there needs to be a relationship of fiduciary duty to, okay, 
There needs to be that relationship. But also, if you're tipping, you need to get something more, something else. And slowly we start to see these elements or requirements build up. Right. Disclosure of saying is sort of, you know, a wide swath mm-hmm. of this. No one can trade if you're in possession of material, non-public information. Pal starts to chip away. I hear that, that there is a fiduciary duty requirement that comes out of Chirella and then in Dirks to show the presence of a fiduciary duty. One way that you would see that from a tipper to be in a tipper to be situation would be this pecuniary gain, personal benefit test idea. Okay. And so Powell says Dirks didn't get anything. So he, there's no personal benefit that ran to Dirks. Is that right? He's just the whistleblower here. Right. He's basically serving the function that he should be serving in the mark. And it doesn't exactly go to Dirks because he's in a role where he's an investment advisor. He's not necessarily a trader or someone who is going into publicly held companies to understand the disclosures that they're making and then building into their pricing model. However, he kind of sees them acting in somewhat of the same way, such that if the chairman of the board or CFO needs to disclose information to traders or market makers, they need to be able to disclose that information freely without fear of tip or liability, because that actually derives the fair market price of the security. Otherwise, it's just pure speculation and investment analysts aren't able to do their jobs. Okay. So Powell is almost sympathetic to the role of investment analysts and to others who need to maybe have that information and to, and to be able to trade on it, especially to avoid maybe this Enron level disaster. Yeah. I think that's the second part of it. I think that's what he says, but I think it really is to ensure the full facilities of the market. So he's really concerned about making sure things are running efficiently and being priced correctly. And the investment analyst example is a concrete example that he can give where if they are unable to receive the information for fear of a 10b5 violation, the fair pricing will kind of disappear. Okay. And so is Dirk still good law? I mean, where do we go after that? That was in, I guess, (laughs) mid 80s. What happens after that? (laughs) I guess to, is Dirk's good law it depends on who you ask, but <laughs> for, for the most part, yes, yeah, it is. But then we get to some of the fun, sexy insider trading cases. So uh, I guess I'll start with Newman. So this was actually a case out of the Second Circuit. So we're not in the Supreme Court right now. When is this? Because yeah. I know Dirk's is like mid 80s, 87, I think. Now, when is the Newman case even? What's the time period? We're in the 2000s. So a little bit more sophisticated, which you'll see throughout this podcast that the more sophisticated technology in the financial markets gets, the more attenuated these opinions get because they're trying to catch up with the technology and quite frankly, the ingenuity of people trying to avoid these liabilities. So the Newman case is just the epitome of the tipper, tippy, daisy chain case that you'd see like in a movie or on the show Billions. So essentially, there were two chains of what I'll call tipper tippies. And they were both stemming from insiders at NVIDIA and Dell, respectively. But what's interesting in, as opposed to the Dirks case, where Dirks receives the information and directly tells his clients, in this case, the final traders were actually four to five levels removed from the original breach of fiduciary duty telling the first tipper. So just to put into perspective how crazy this is, because I had to say it out loud, somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody who told somebody who traded. So <laughs> okay. So just the, the absurdity of that sentence, if it is a sentence itself, <laughs> should show you how complicated this was. And in the final tippers were two people called Newman and Chiazon, although Newman's the name defendant in this case, so it just typically goes by Newman. And they were brokerage dealers, portfolio managers at a company that just dealt in the regular financial markets. So it brought up a really interesting point on tipper tippy liability for one. And then one other point that I'll get to that this case isn't really known for, but I find really interesting. So the Second Circuit kind of had this four prong test. So the first one was that the corporate insider, that is the original tipper, must be entrusted with fiduciary duty. 
the corporate insider breached his fiduciary duty by disclosing confidential information to a tippy in exchange for a personal benefit. So there you kind of see the personal benefit test rolled into this. Third, the tippy knew of the tipper's breach. And four, the kind of all-encompassing, the tippy still use that information to trade in a security or tip another individual. So okay. that fourth one is interesting because you can either trade or tip. So that daisy chain technically can't extend based on the four dollars. Sure. Okay. So this case, in my opinion, is most known for their second prong of their test. And that is the corporate insider breached his fiduciary duty by disclosing confidential information to Tippy in exchange for a personal benefit. And that subpart is where they really get held up. So the second circuit held that this, they did not show that the tip or received a personal benefit because there was not a meaningfully close relationship between the tipper and the tippy. Now, as you can tell, meaningfully close is subject to a wide array of what does that mean? Yeah, and um, is, the, is the meaningfully close in the Dirk's language or is that new? I believe that is new. It used to just be a relationship. And then he gave some examples of which would suffice, but none of which directly stated that it needed to be a meaningfully close relationship. I think the Dirk's language is trading relative or friend without any actual qualifiers on that. So now Newman is saying, well, that needs to be meaningfully close. Okay. And what else? And so there was no meaningfully close relationship. There exists, in fact, patterns that some of the tip bores and tippies were casual attendants at the same church. A tip or a tippy would go out for drinks and they'd give each other, or one would ask for career advice. It's just general clear advice that you do if you're a trader in New York. But none of these were considered to fall under this meaningfully close requirement. So on that stand alone, it would fall and uh, liability would not be imposed. However, they also found that the third prong was also not found. And that, I think, for me at least, is the most interesting part of this case because of what potentially could happen by the finding that the, the scienter element was not found. So they found that the tip E did not have requisite knowledge that the tipper, the original tipper, breached their fiduciary duty, hmm. which is okay. That's fine in this case because the meaningfully close language is really gets what teed up and is more litigated in the Salmon case that's upcoming. But if you disregard the meaningfully close relationship prong and just focus on the scienter for this daisy chain, it creates somewhat of a perverse incentive that if you can have your final trader be so far removed from the original breach of fiduciary duty, the more daisy chains, the more, I'll call them conspirators for lack of a better word, that you add onto this chain, the less likely it is for a jury or a court to find that the final trader actually knew of the original breach. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And back to the meaningfully close, how does the Second Circuit define that? What is it they say is necessary to show that something is a meaningfully close relationship? I believe there was one that they, I think they might have said familial relationship or one that you receive a pecuniary benefit for, which was very similar to what they, Powell wrote in Dirks. So that's I interesting. I, I think that's what is fascinating when I had seen Newman is that they conflated that. They said meaningfully close means you got paid, basically, right? And which, I mean, I feel like in the Dirk's language, he separates that out as sort of separate examples. But Newman sort of, like I said, conflates or pushes those things together. So it has to be a meaningfully close trading relative or friend. And the way you know it's meaningfully close is because you got, there's some pecuniary gain. It was funny. Another classmate and I were actually writing a paper based on these cases and spent half an hour arguing over a comma placement in that exact phrase because with a comma there, it reads one way. With a comma not there, it reads almost as dicta. Oh, that's so, very lawyerly of you. That's <laughs> it was a long Friday night. <laughs> but yes, I think you are right. And by instilling that extra pecuniary gain, I don't think they really were thinking through what they were doing because... Dirks, Powell had already said, a pecuniary gain, a quid pro quo, money for tips or tips for tips, that establishes. So I don't understand why they needed to go reaching for this, especially in a case where the defendants weren't 
all that sympathetic. You know, we've seen a bunch of cases where sympathetic defendants can often bend the law to make sure bad things don't happen to good people. In this case, the law was bent, but these people weren't necessarily good people. They were just traitors well, yeah. that got this information. Yeah. I mean, you do think there's a little bit of a, a spin, you know, they're, they're hanging out at church and you kind of feel like you know them a little bit by this deep dive into how well they know each other, which to me already is a little bit bananas that whether or not criminal liability attaches here depends on whether or not, depends on how close of buddies they are, which is a little bit outside. I think the typical way we think that criminal law or certainly civil or criminal liability should attach. Maybe that's exactly what they were trying to do. Maybe they saw that and saying, who am I to tell if you sit next to each other in a church pew, if you're good friends, why don't we add this extra requirement to reduce us having to look into your personal lives? Why don't we make it more concrete? Maybe yeah. that was the reason. That's a really good point. Okay. And so what happens with Newman? Does, it, does the Supreme Court clarify this new kind of maybe element that they've introduced uh, that meaningfully close personal relationship is required and that that can mean exchange of money or, or what, where does, what happens with that? So they give some clarification. They don't take Newman to the Supreme Court. They wait for another case to come out, which some people found was a little strange. But nevertheless, we get Solomon, which comes up, which again, it involves a tipper tippy relationship, although the daisy chain is much smaller than in Newman, which again, I think is important. So Solomon comes out of the Ninth Circuit. It's cert granted up to the Supreme Court. I believe it was in the late 2010s, mid 2010s. So very similar to Newman. But this defendant is even less sympathetic than Newman was in the original case. So the tipper, the insider, was a guy named Maher Kara. He was an insider at Citigroup. And he had lots of non-public inf- material non-public information concerning different mergers and acquisitions that were going to go on. So his brother, Michael, would receive this material non-public information from Maher and make trades upon this information. So original tippy tipper stuff. One of the key facts that rings true in my head that I can't forget is Maher actually asked his brother if he needed help, financial help. He was in a position to give him money. He said, no, I don't want your money, but could you give me more inside tips? So the kind of the scienter problem in Newman goes right out the window. That I thought was interesting. So Salman is the tippy's brother-in-law. So now we have the tip war, the original tippy, the brother, and then the brother-in-law, Salman. Salman receives this information from Michael Carr, the original tippy. And then he turns around, Salman turns around and uses the information to trade in like third-party brokerage accounts, which already kind of looking sketchy. If you're going to do it, you think you're okay, use your own brokerage account, but all right, we'll give them a pass. So I think the lower court, I think you actually wanted to speak real quickly on the, what the lower court's decision was before it bumped up. Oh, to the Supreme court. Sure, because I know this was outside the scope of our readings for that week. But interesting facts for those of us who follow along with the insider trading regulations and certain cases that are of note, most of which come out of the Second Circuit in New York. What was interesting about the Solomon case is that it came out of the Ninth Circuit, but the person who was writing for the court was. U.S. District Judge Jed Rakoff, who typically sits in the district court in the Second Circuit. So he was given this rare chance to be sitting by designation on the Ninth Circuit panel when this case comes up. So the irony here is that he ends up penning a case or an opinion that goes up to the Supreme Court that ends up implicating or certainly having ramifications that affect his bosses at the the Second Circuit. So it's, it's just an interesting sort of small world among jurists who are deciding these, these cases. But anyway, that's a bit of a, a digression. You tell me more about um, what the court ends up saying in Salmon. Yeah. So the court takes umbrage with the Second Circuit and it's Newman's opinion. So basically it states that Maher originally breached his duty to Citigroup by disclosing that material non-public information which is no news there, and then disclose it as a gift to his brother with the expectation, and especially in this case, the knowledge, because he knew his brother was trading on it, that his brother would trade on it and make a profit. Salman, the court said, then acquired this duty and breached himself by trading on this information with the full knowledge it had been improperly disclosed. So specifically, they were really 
worried about a jury verdict based on a second circuit that the second circuit opinion in Newman that would have allowed the jury that would have required him to show a meaningfully close relationship, brother-in-law suffices, but also that he would have received a pecuniary gain for that. So money or tips or something of the sort. The Supreme Court did not like that. And they said that, no, in this case, we're going to look at traditional gift theory and say that in this kind of jury verdict or this jury instruction, the jury is fully allowed to find that a meaningfully close relationship arises out of the presence of a mere familial relationship, which is a huge turning point because that was the sticking point of Newman, was that there was no pecuniary benefit. So the liability couldn't have attached, scienter aside. So when I actually originally read this, I thought it did a lot more than it actually did, because there's very flowing language and examples and kind of dicta indicating that things might be some way or might be the other. But at the very bottom of this case, they basically just say that, okay, no, the pecuniary gain is not needed if there's a meaningfully close relationship. And that meaningfully close relationship can arise solely from a familial interaction or relationship. Brother-in-law, brother and brother, father and son, mother and daughter. And actually going back and reading this more and more, I think the court could have gone farther. And I think they were actually quite reluctant and restrictive in their opinion, in their actual holding. The dictas can be taken different ways, but as far as what they've ultimately decided, when I originally read the opinion, I thought it was going to be a lot more game-changing. Yeah, it's really not at all. I mean, in fact, I, I wrote a quick piece when it was granted cert or maybe after it was decided that was essentially like, the Roberts Court keeps taking these cases that do nothing to change the law or they seem, this is down the line exactly in line with the, what Dirks is holding. You have a trading relative or friend, literally a relative here. If it had been a friend, maybe we'd get a little bit more into the what is meaningfully close or not. And do we need that qualifier at all? Or are we going to write that back out? Which they sort of do a little bit in Salmon, but they definitely say the Newman thing is nonsense. No one has ever said you need a pecuniary gain to show meaningfully close relationships. So that gets sort of tossed. But in terms of what Solomon decides it's it's nothing. I mean, it's really is Dirks is still the law. And here's an example of of the Dirks personal benefit test right here in, in real time. So, I mean, I think that's why it's an 8-0 decision because uh, Scalia had just passed away when they decided yeah. that. So it ends up it's, it's only 8-0, but it's a, I think it's a no brainer to them in some ways. No, I agree. And it's strange because I know later in the podcast series, they'll get into misappropriation, but it seems like the court is more apt to look at misappropriation in terms of technological innovation and less apt to look towards, I guess I'll call it social innovation on the tip or tippy side, because the technological innovation, you can see hackers or people trying to infiltrate systems or stuff like that. But people aren't dumb, and especially people in a marketplace that is known to prize alpha and any opportunity that you can get, they're going to find a way to socially engineer things to get what they want. And the Newman to Salman, and then Salman kind of almost dropping the ball, in my opinion, it doesn't allow for the same ramp. Up. And obviously, misappropriation is its own thing. And it's still an ever-growing piece of the law. But it seems like tip or tip li- tippy liability is running with a crutch compared to how misappropriation is going. And that's fair. And that's actually what we'll discuss. It's a perfect segue. What we'll discuss <laughs> next week when we talk about the Carpenter case and even more, the role of Powell and getting that case, the cert decision at least, reheard to have it actually go up for cert to the court, and how he really wanted to just put a nail in the coffin on misappropriation there. He really he wanted to tamp all the other avenues for insider trading regulation down. But then, as we'll learn in the next episode, through this another sort of interesting twist of fate, which keeps happening in this area of the law. <laughs> Misappropriation stays alive. And as you pointed out, is the most powerful, I think, theory under which the SEC and others bring um, insider trading cases. So, I mean, that's a great segue. So I just have maybe just a couple follow-ups sort of before we wrap up. But the first is, where does this leave the SEC on tip or tippy? And maybe you sort of address that, but does this change something? Where are we now then with, with that idea? Yes, it did change it, but not in a way that 
was necessarily meaningful. Instead, it just dropped. It dropped a requirement. Instead of <laughs> seeing from the abstain disclose where we build, 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 build. In this Supreme Court case, Salman just said, hey, second circuit, you went too far on this one. So no, if you can show a familial relationship, Justice Powell said that in Dirks. So you're going overboard. You don't need that pecuniary game. So in hmm. some sense, yes, it did. And it made it easier for either the DOJ or the SEC to pursue criminal or civil liability, which is one thing. But no, it, it was just a drop off of a requirement that was added in the mid 2010s. And then a couple of years later was redecided. So I don't think it was as seminal as, as Dirks or Corella. I think it was just right. kind of a recorrection. Okay. Well stated. I think that's probably correct. All right. So last question, sort of last thought, which you've given us a little bit, I think, of insight of what your thoughts are on this. But what is what is your thought? Do you think this is correct? Do you think this is the right outcome that we are sort of shifted back to a Dirk's paradigm? Or I don't know what if you could wave your wand and change this or not. What are your general thoughts? So I've actually really struggled with this because Justice Powell really wanted to root 10b-5 violations in common law fraud. That was his thing. And Dirks has really stood the taps of time for the vast majority. Some courts have found differing meanings within it, but the core of it stays. So I'm okay with that. The problem that I have is not so much in the SEC realm. It's in the DOJ realm. If these courts are going to accept Dirks as the primary method of proving tipper tippy liability, and then sending someone to jail, they should know, and they, the people being charged, should know exactly what they are being charged for and if what they are doing is wrong. I find it very, very concerning that Solman, in this case, even though he probably he knew what he was doing was wrong, he, that's all fine and good. But as far as the law was laid out by the Second Circuit and no one else questioned them, if he didn't receive money, if there was no pecuniary gain, even though that was his brother-in-law, it was okay. And even though he might have not known the law, his attorney might not have known the law, his brother-in-law might not, it doesn't matter. It's the law. And there, I find it a very hard due process concern to deal with changing the criminal liability around with courts exercising this judicial pine cone out of which an oak no, was it's a legislative, like legislative acorn that turned into a yes. judicial oak. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have a big problem on the criminal side with stripping someone's liability. If you haven't read our papers yet, I go on a very long and rambling tangent about that. So that'll be fun. <laughs> excellent. It was excellent. I, I, I will say your defense firm is very lucky to have you with that take. <laughs> it'll, be a, it'll be a zealous advocate for your clients. That's great. Well, Colin, thanks so much. This has been a delight and I've learned so much and I hope you've enjoyed this too. And I hope the listeners have all learned a lot from this. If you don't have any other sort of final thoughts, I just want, I want to thank you for participating and coming on and be sure to tune in to our future episodes where we keep going down the rabbit hole on insider trading regulation. Yeah, thank you very much. Can't wait to listen to the next episodes. <laughs> <laughs>